and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a, a newcomer into the temple. One half of the double-headed monster that is Real Fun Studios. That's re that's real with two E's, by the way. And creator of the upcoming RPG, The Gun Belt. The one and only Ryan Farcelli. How you doing today, man? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. I've been having a bit of a laugh at the pe at the people who don't seem to know. Um. How, that... wi how winter weather works. Oh. You know, beca because I'm in the Midwest. It's not, And then people act surprised when there's snow on the ground one day. <laughs> and, and I'm just, I'm just sitting, I'm just sitting here going, you all knew this was coming. I kept I kept saying winter is coming, but you, but no, you but no, you're like no, you're just a doomsayer. You're just a, you're just you're just hate you're just hating the sup you're just hating the summer. <laughs> all right, but eventually it's gonna come, and when that when that time comes, I will have free ammo. <laughs> I don't I don't know where you're at, but I am outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it was. 87 degrees out two days ago and today it was 29 for tennessee yeah that tracks yeah it's a big change though not happy about it um it's been 28 for most for most of the day here but the saying that i've that i've always had is it's not the cold it's the wind chill well, you're in the Midwest, so that is definitely. I grew up in Chicago, so you are. I I completely agree with you. It's not cold till you have a wind chill factor. My sympathies for growing up in Chicago, <laughs> because because you because you unfortunately had to deal with the with the um, plague on humanity that is Cubs fans. Oh, now come on! I'm a Cubs fan. <laughs> We're we're all losers, baby. <laughs> Look, if you want to blame all your mistakes on a bill, on a billy goat from almost a hundred years ago, that's that's your prerogative. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it makes for good stories. Yeah, or a good or a good or a good song because somebody did a parody song called "Please Stop Believing," <laughs> and. Truth be told, truth be told, I pick fun. I make fun of ev of every fan base. No, sure. no, but I believe in true equality. I roast, <laughs> I roast everyone equally. But I'm, I'm in favor. I'm for it. And well, the well, these days I have if I, if I want to pick on teams in Chicago, I can I can always pick on the I can always pick on the White Sox just as much. <laughs> I I'll join you. <laughs> When I when I was a kid, there was a a joke, you know, because there's a they they have what's called the Windy City Classic, where like once a year the Cubs play the Sox, mm -hmm. and so they're in whether they're playing home or away, they're in a stadium in Chicago, and there's this joke that a Cubs fan and a Sox fan are both using the men's room at the same time, and when they get finished, the the Cubs fan starts to walk out, and the Sox fan stops to wash his hands, and the Sox fan says, "Hey." Aren't you going to wash your hands? Here on the south side, they teach us to wash our hands after we go to the bathroom. And the Cubs fan says, yes, but on the north side, they teach us, don't piss on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of, co of course, if I want to really amplify the pain, I can always make fun of Bears fans. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The point is, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. There you go. But one of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Well, I was 
in ninth grade in high school in a little town outside of Chicago, Cedar Lake, Indiana. And there was a group of us at lunchtime that would, uh, during, during lunch, like we, we would eat really fast and then we would go down to the school library where we would play the very first role-playing game I ever played, which was the old TSR Marvel superheroes game. If you remember, it comes in the big yellow, came in the big yellow starter box. Yep. Marvel phase rip. Phase rip. That's right. <laughs> and so we, we, I played that for quite a while and that uh, really, that kind of stuck with me. And then from there I ended up in Dungeons and Dragons, you know, gaming crack and uh, got into Werewolf the Apocalypse pretty good for a while. Even did some LARPing in that area. I uh, married my very, my wife is my very first Werewolf LARP storyteller <laughs> i always find that to be funny uh so if you ever wanted great xp <laughs> marry your storyteller <laughs> especially if she's pretty it helps uh <laughs> and so i've been kind of gaming ever since i love just about all the role-playing games that i love all the role-play games <laughs> i like uh all the world of darkness stuff uh big fan of seventh c from john wick um you know tales from the loop is great Dungeons and Dragons, I, you know, I, I could go on. I've got more books than I need. Sometimes I feel like we're collectors more than we're players. A uh, little bit, little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Yeah, but it could, it, it could, it could be, it could be worse. You could be, you could be trying to, um. Uh, Still, still, still play. I don't know. I don't know. Riffs as written. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's one game. Thankfully, I was never in a role playing game group that thought Rifts was great. So, I I avoided I I avoided that one somehow. Dodge the bullet. Mm -hmm. All 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 critics have their whipping boys, and Rifts is one of mine. If I'm not if I'm not picking on. Um, how how absolutely nuts some of the, some of those early entries when it came to when it came when it came to the when it came to the more simmy stu simmy stuff, especially a lot of those that came out in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, um, fantasy games unlimited. I've yet I've yet to see a game of theirs I'd I'd like, and. <laughs> Um, I've I've stated on multiple occasions I will not run Phoenix Command again unless I'm paid. Right. Yeah, I think that at some point you end up in this little little spot where if you need a calculator to do the math to figure out if you succeed or fail, that maybe the game's a little a little off kilter and not quite good for me. <laughs> well, in some in some cases I've had I've had the rule of if your game does not have a in if have an index in the back or proper or proper um, bookmarking if it's a PDF um, that should be punishable by a public flogging right or either that or put you in the stocks and have everyone throw tomatoes at you <laughs> um. well I remember the the early wizard the early white wolf games uh, the first vamp vampire book there was a printing error and none of the pages the page none of the page numbers in the index were actually filled out and so they all just said xxx mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's no, it's the only thing worse than not having an index is trying to have one but not <laughs> yeah so with the, with that said when it comes to the gun belt was this an, was this an idea that had been kicking around for a for a while what was the origin story of how this particular thing came about well the gun belt is uh, about alien and robot cowboys that ride dinosaurs in an interstellar wild west that's kind of our elevator pitch and it came from a lot of different influences uh i'm I, the co-creator i'm the primary writer and the primary co-creator but there were two of us that kind of genesis the idea um he was a big uh he was a big Brave Star fan, the cartoon from the the late eighties or mm -hmm. mid eighties, I guess. He was a big Brave Star fan. We also both of us loved Firefly, and uh, my daughter at the time uh, was obsessed with dinosaurs. Still is, 
Um, and so it was kind of a lot of different, a lot of different things all coming together at once to make this sort of interstellar wild west uh, with, you know, a, a little bit of a, a wild, wild west kind of, uh, we call it magnet punk. It's not quite steampunk, mm. uh, but uh, it, it kind of just came together that way. We wanted a game that would be simple enough for my 14 year old to run for all of her friends and they could you know, play a silly game where it was just a group of cowpokes going out and fighting a dinosaur. And then I wanted also the game to be robust enough that I could run it for my adult friends and run a story of uh, the oppressive corporatocracy Levacor that runs the the planet and is greedy and, and you know, hurts people and doesn't do well and, and makes everything that's already harsh about living on this pioneer planet even worse um and, and you know have a deep a deep harsh story with uh, some metaphor and and you know look at some issues and so i think the cool thing about the gun belt is we kind of pulled that off we were in development for a little over five years which is um i i feel like it's a little long mm. uh but you know but most most professional well let me back up and not say professional most game designers either have been working on their game for 30 years and it will never be done or they are uh published and they work on their games for like one to two years and then push them out um we ended up going five years because we've never done it before um we've always just been players and so there was a lot of play testing that we needed to do to work things out and then we were also that also puts us right in the middle of the pandemic and that kind of stopped everything in particular it stopped people getting together at conventions where you can play tests so mm -hmm. so when i say it took a little over five years I, I like to think that if there hadn't been a pandemic it might have been like three three and a half but uh on the flip side it taking that long has allowed us to really look at the universe and the world and the the store the backstory of of what's going on in genre so to speak and uh, get rid of the stuff that we really get rid of the stuff that we don't like and take the stuff that we do like and really develop it farther than a lot of a lot of games would normally develop that's mm -hmm. and where were there and you mentioned brave star and you mentioned firefly but were there any were there any other um shows games co comics or what have you that served as that served as influence for the design of gun belt uh not from a, a genre standpoint um the other there is another big influence in the genre but it isn't specifically a game or a tv show and that's the uh coal mining towns of appalachia in the 1930s and um you know this idea that uh they these towns were run by a corporatocracy it was uh uh the the local government of the town was the coal mining company and so the coal mining company owned the coal mine they owned the houses that the coal miners lived in they owned the local grocery store that the coal miners would buy their groceries from uh, and so they printed their own money that was coal mine company scripts that's they were called scripts uh, and so basically they kept the economy completely segregated from the rest of of america and and you know if they wanted to trade their scripts for actual dollars the um the markup on that was obscene and all of these folks would lose a, a lot of money the coal miners would and it was all meant to make the coal mine more money you know because all of that money stayed within themselves and so it enabled the it enabled the coal mine to make a lot of profit on every single thing and so we wanted to create uh, kind of a, a whole country that was run by a mining company. And and in our game, it's not coal, it's a, a mineral called levitite. And levitite is this sort of mystical crimson colored rock that floats. And so that's sort of the other kind of driving genre thing in our game is we're a world without wheels. Uh, anything that would have a wheel on it does not. Instead, they use this rock to make it float. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time, is is that particular mineral pervasive enough to the point where it's used as cur where it can be used as currency, or is there a different type of currency that's that's used just for standard business? Sure, no, they they do not use that. They actually just use Levacor scripts. 
Uh, and so it's, it's a company script that is actually, you know, technically it's actually worthless. It's not backed by anything. Uh, it's, it's just a, a currency the company made up and put a number on it. Mm-hmm. And it enables, it enables them to profit from every single transaction that happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now the rock is valuable though. You know, they charge a lot. If you want to mine it, you have to pay you know, permit, you have to buy permits from Levacor. If you want to have it processed, you can only have it processed by an official, you know, registered Levacor plant. Um, you know, they, they make sure that they make their money every step of the way. Uh, but the important thing about Levitite is that as they mine it, it's in the air, it's, it's everywhere. And as it's become so prevalent in everyday life, this mystical kind of floating rock has started to affect the people who live on the planet. And those are the kinds of characters that, that players would play. They call them Hellions because the, the planet, they call it hell. Mm-hmm. And Hellions are people that have been affected by this exposure to Levitite, and it enables them to have extraordinary abilities. It's not, it's not magic, but it does let them do things that are a little bit more amazing than just a normal person would be able to you know, under normal circumstances. Mm-hmm. So, with that in now, with that in mind, what I know that it, I know that in the in the main material, it's mentioned that um, the effects of the, of that exposure to le, to levitite um, allows for um, powers in the form of bur- in the form of burdens. Right, that's that's what they call their these extraordinary abilities, mm-hmm. and they they call them burdens because uh, when you're able to do extraordinary, when you are able to do extraordinary things, the price that comes with that is people ask you to do extraordinary things for them, especially when you are in a world where it is so difficult to live, mm-hmm. you know, struggling to survive on the harsh wild plains of, you know, of this Western planet while also dealing with an oppressive you know, evil, greedy, uh, corporate government, uh, it makes, it makes life particularly difficult. And then someone comes along who can do something extraordinary. Well, that's who you go to for help. And so, so players carry this, this burden Mm -hmm. and, and these burdens are our powers that let them do just a little bit extra. Yeah. Not a whole lot extra, just a little bit, just a little bit, but it's enough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And one of the one of the great things that we did mechanically that I think kind of sets our sets our game a little bit apart is that we use a uh, a bullet point system, and so there is a pool of bullet points that sit in the middle of the table that the players all have to share. And to make one of your burdens work, you have to spend a bullet point. But that means if you are in a gunfight or a conflict of some type and there's only one bullet point left, you kind of have to talk to the other players and and decide, is it worth using the bullet point for this or do we need to save it in case we need something else? Uh, And there's sort of a a mechanical economy that happens between the tail spinner, which is our storyteller or or dungeon master if it was D&D, but our tail spinner and our players kind of have a... Uh, an economy that goes back and forth where they they give and take these bullet points uh, and and that all that all supports our theme uh, the you know the theme of the game is this idea that when you are um, when you are struggling to survive you're stronger when you work together and so that kind of represents that mechanically mm-hmm. now the bullet point system that you that you have it does Based on the way you describe it, it does fall into a term that I've u- I've used for a lot of games with with a with a sort of limited use um, boost. Mm-hmm. I I refer to this as an extra effort mechanic. Sure. Um, that examples in uh, examples of what I mean by this in other games would be say Edge in Shadowrun, uh, Willpower in any of the World of Darkness games. Um. Blood, a blood point in in vampire, rage rage or gnosis in werewolf. Those those ones are a bit those ones are a bit more specific. Um, will spending willpower is a bit more of a universal thing. Sure, Whereas no, that's fair. Blood points in something like vampire. That's just your that's just your MP in a different coat of paint. 
Sure, sure. Oh, but give but given that there's the tendency for people to be ver to be conservative with limited resources, in playtesting, have you had any instance of somebody um, falling into what I like to call the rainy day paradox? Well, what we noticed in playtesting is is something similar to what what you're you're describing is the idea that players would uh, hesitate to spend and because they were afraid they weren't going to get it back. And so the way we addressed that is we uh, we kind of looked at the mechanics of other games that have something similar, right? Uh, we looked at things like uh, drama points. Uh, I think they were drama points or dr maybe they were just drama dice. Drama points in uh, the original 7C game, right? Uh, function that way. Um, force points back in the old Westing games, Star Wars game kind of fun function that way this idea that you would spend them but also you could earn them back uh your storyteller could could give them back to you and replenish your pool uh, but what and what we noticed the flaw in that whole idea was people were scared to spend them uh they were quick to spend them at first and then scared to spend them as they got low mm -hmm. and and there is a little bit of of like to that we do like that a little bit because it adds some tension and it adds it, it raises the stakes a little uh, but we also don't want people to not be able to play their character. And so the way we address that is uh, we looked at how how do those points get replenished. And obviously the the really simple thing is you you set up a rule where like you know the storyteller, the tail spinner rewards good role play, right? So that's one way that you can get it back. But then the that also has a problem because what one, tail spinner thinks is good role play is not the same as what another tail spinner might think is good role play. Every table is going to judge good role play differently. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a vague, a vague way to get one. So we realized if we have this vague way that they can get points back, that empowers the tail spinner to be able to adjust their judgment, you know, give them, give, be a little more lenient and give them more often or not, depending upon how they're spending. Um, and, and we wrote, encourage that encouragement into the the rules text but we also know that that's not going to actually work at every table so the other thing that we did was we created a hard mechanic that returned bullet points as well and so one of those hard mechanics is when the storyteller when the tail spinner is running an npc that activates one of the npc's burdens the the tail spinner puts a bullet point back in the player's pool so when you're actually in combat against another NPC that has, you know, that has these powers, there is actually a back and forth happening, right? Um, and, and that's kind of interesting because it creates a little bit of a competitiveness. Like if I spend a point, I'm going to have to give it to my players, but they're down to nothing. And, you know, like uh, how, how much do I want to empower or not empower them to make this dramatic uh, and then we've also got another hard mechanic where if they roll a 17 total or higher, that's called a bullet or a, that's called a bullseye success. And if they roll a bullseye success, they automatically earn one back. And so, so that creates a situation where we've got, uh, we kind of have all three levels of, um, of recompense with, with bullet points. You know, there's one that's just a hard mechanic that could happen at any time with any die roll. There's one that's very subjective with like, does the tail spinner think that was a good, good role play or not? And then there's one that kind of falls right in the middle, you know? So, uh, and, and we actually found that when we did that, it, uh, it really did actually kind of address the problem, uh, pretty effectively. And, and it created a situation where players were actually laughing and enjoying the debate of is it worth spending this last one or not? Mm -hmm. Because they knew that they might only they might only have to go one round to get one before they get one back, but they might not. And so like it it added it added some hope to uh to that sort of thing, but also that it upped the tension. And so it it actually ended up being a really uh great great solution to to your rainy day problem. Yeah. Uh I've sometimes also called the rainy day problem the um, 99 mega elixirs issue. <laughs> you know, 
I can't use one of I can't use one of my ninety nine megaluxes. What if I need it for later? They say right. they say in the middle of the final boss. Yep. <laughs> oh. But I did I did notice that you are there's a there's a couple of things that I did notice when it comes to the core mechanics. One, you're sure. using a two D six system. Right. Which I'm guessing that was to make was to make things um as accessible as you, as possible. Right. And there's also a little bit of a thematic element in that six shooters, you know, our our Wild West pistols. So mm -hmm. so we like the six. The number six feels feels thematic. Um uh, which if if that's the case, does does that mean that if somebody brings a giant pair of D sixes then th then their six shooter is a um is a Magnum Research BFR or something? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I I have to make that I had to make that joke because it, it because that that was a that was a rifle that was a um, revolver design that was considered and is way too big for <laughs> way too big <laughs> because it's in forty five seventy government that is too big <laughs> that and because because of that you've got a rifle that weighs like seven pounds jeez not a rifle a, revol a revolver so I, I end up saying rifle out of habit. <laughs> Um, the BFR is supposed to stand for Big Frame Revolver, but if you've played Doom, you probably think you probably know what it should have standed for instead. <laughs> uh, of course, that's perfectly fine with me because I like giving my players ridiculously powerful but unsafe weapons. Right, right. Uh, like I, that was that was the thing with with the gun belt. We were real careful of too, is we wanted to make sure that guns were deadly. You know, in the Wild West, uh, in the Wild West, like you rarely would see a hero take more than three bullets, you know. Uh, and so that's exactly what we did. We used a, uh, we call it a health cylinder, but basically the way our health system works is you have, have six points of health, just like a, a six, the six shooter theme again. Uh, and so if you get, sh you know, a bullet does two points of damage. And so if you get shot three times, you are dropped. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we we like we like because the wild west has such a gray area motif you know characters are rarely good or evil in wild west uh genre stories we made sure that uh, to kill someone it had to be intentional right so if you shoot someone three times they fall to the ground but if you want them to be dead you then must shoot them you know one more time you have to do one more point of damage but they are incapacitated and and out uh at that so but three shots is not is not a lot you know especially in a, a gunfight where you've got four or five uh gunslingers shooting at one another but we wanted to make gunfights deadly um and and you know i think i think we succeeded with that and deadly was important because it needed to feel like like a western and also we made them deadly because there is a challenge in that westerns all end in gunfights and what we really didn't want was a boring game where every combat was roll shooting roll dodge roll shooting roll dodge roll shooting roll dodge right there's no excitement to that like it, it feels like you're a one skill game and so uh so we made sure that combats don't last long <laughs> to avoid that and and if if a bullet if taking a bullet is more deadly then you're going to stop and put some thought into your approach to combats you're not going to just run in you know with your 80 hit points and <laughs> start throwing your sword around yeah and if i'm not if i'm not mistaken the the approach that you the approach that you have when it comes to um, when it comes to combat is you don't I didn't see, I'm assuming that um, combat is going to revolve around contested roles more than um, roles versus static def, roles versus static values. Well, it it's, the answer is a little bit of both. Uh, so with a with a bind room role game system with a binumeral mechanic like this where you roll 2d6 and then you add that total to your skill points and and then add your attribute to it uh you want to hit a 12 which is a success uh mm -hmm. and and so in a system like that 
uh, you want to make sure that they roll a success and then you roll, make it contested. Because if it was just a contested roll, then even the worst gun, even someone, a character that's never shot a gun before mm -hmm. could still hit the best of gunslingers simply because the gunslinger rolled bad. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't want it. That, that felt silly to us. Um, it didn't feel realistic. Not that we're trying to make it super realistic, but it, it felt strange to us. And so, um, so we made it so that you roll your shooting. And if you make a 12, then the other player that you are shooting at must roll their dodge and out roll you. So you not, you don't have to roll a dodge if they don't roll that 12 yeah. because they just missed. And if I'm if unless I'm unless I'm missing something, it is a case of two d six plus attribute plus um skill. Correct. So and because because one and that brings me to one other thing I f I found a bit curious, and that is um skills seem to go up to five but ranks four and five have their own little subcategory which i bl which um i was curious how that particular thing came about sure so with uh um, with our burden system that's the, the the powers the mystical powers right uh every skill has three burdens attached to it right uh and each player if they get five points in there in that skill they will only have two of those three burdens you can never have all three the way our mechanics work uh, you get your first skill burden when the skill level is three and then at five you get the second mm -hmm. uh, and at four points in a skill you earn you earn a reputation for being great at it so someone with the so the shooting skill because we're talking a lot about guns uh, since it's a western the shooting skill if you have four stars in shooting then you earn the reputation of being a gunslinger mm -hmm. and reputation is kind of a it's a soft mechanic in our game but the idea is that if you walk into a bar and uh, somebody is is you know an NPC starts giving you a hard time or harassing you uh, the player can spend a bullet point and say, yeah, but I'm a gunslinger, so all of these folks know not to mess with me because I could shoot them and kill them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I take that bullet point, and I'm like, you're right, and they start to leave you alone. Uh, it's a, a, a soft mechanic that enables the players to have a little bit of a cooperative storytelling you know, shift in the narrative. Um, one of the weird things, I think, uh, it's weird to me as a, uh, someone who's been playing games for 35 years is there's definitely a shift in the way games are designed you know when when i was a kid and playing the marvel superheroes game and, and early D D, the the dungeon master or the storyteller they were they were god, they were god right what it was their story what they said went they were the judge the arbiter um and all of those things uh they were in charge and there has been a shift and now games, there are a lot of games that are much more narrative driven or are a lot more cooperative storyteller driven. You know, there's a lot of games where they encourage uh, storytellers to source the table, you know, mm -hmm. where they're like, you walk into this bar, tell me, what do you guys know? What do your characters know about this bar? Yeah. And then the players are like, well, I know that this bar is a, uh, is also a cigar bar. And, and then the storyteller would be like, that's right. And so when you walk in, you're hit with this cloud of smelly smoke and, you you see all of these old guys and they're smoking cigars and they're all wealthy, you know, and they let the players kind of, they source, they source the ideas from the table a little bit. Um, and so this was a way to kind of honor mm -hmm. the, the shift in storytelling a little bit in our game without taking it so far that, that it's uh super vague or complicated, like a game like fate is like, I think fate, the system is, is very narrative driven like that. It sources the player's, you know, constantly and in a weird way that actually is really uncomfortable and, and difficult for me as sort of an old, <laughs> an older gamer. Uh, but, but I also recognize that games change and there's value and awesomeness in, in both ways. And so we kind of tried to meet those two styles a little bit in the middle. Mm -hmm. And 
as far as that whole the GM is is God kind of thing, yeah. Um, because I have I have been a- I have been asked why why that w- why that was a thing and why that's shifted away. Obviously, I don't have a concrete answer, but he I yeah. do have my own little um hypothesis. Yeah. Okay. Let's ki- let's let's dial the let's dial the clock back to the early seventies. Okay. Role playing, as we as we understand it, evolved off of the war gaming scene in the in the seventies, um, and one of the big things with a lot of war gaming was having a referee, having a specific rules arbiter. Now. As far as the evolution of e- of each of those little elements, there's a there's a bunch of different things I can go into, like some like some of the officer training war games from Poland that got converted into more accessible games, but that's a whole other rabbit hole. Yeah, right, but right. The po- the point is is th- is that the re- the referee in the in those early war games was not far removed from the referee in a sporting event. The only difference is not wearing zebras and not getting booed by everybody. Right, Sorry, right. But it was, really, it was really, <laughs> it was really a, a a rules judge more than more than it was a storyteller. Which is why it, it's referred to as referee in like in like white box. Um, right. But as as people have kind of experimented and the and um the relationship and the line between role playing games and war games has go- has um gone further and further apart there isn't as much of a need for the- for that the gm is go- the gm is god kind of mind kind of mindset um, right there's a- there's a reason why the term rules lawyers became a thing and became a thing that is not exactly a favorable description of people <laughs> um, yeah same same thing same thing with same thing with um Munchkin, but <laughs> but um, I don't I don't know. Steve Jackson Games has made has made good money off of that name, right? Exactly. But the the point is is that, is that well while there are is that as as time has gone on the I, the role playing thing has become its own, has become its own experience just through time. Yeah. And the the idea of the GM as as that particular judge certainly has um, shifted. I I suppose the, I suppose the other thing that's certainly helped that certainly helped move that along is the many different stories of cert, of certain GMs um, railroading or in, or in some cases falling into a trap that my mentor often said, which was a novelist is shorthand for a bad DM. <laughs> and a, a lot of people take umbrage with that because they because they because they're either novelists themselves or or the, or they think that a novelist and a GM can are are something that isn't mutually exclusive. Right. It's important to con- it's important to consider that my mentor would always he liked Zen Cohen's, and the thing about <laughs> Zen Cohen's is you're not supposed to re- you're not supposed to read them straight, and the point with this is it was to beat it over the head that you're not supposed to be writing your writing your own novel you are facilitating a um experience right um, and that i think is the the crux of the shift is it went from being a war simulator to being a storytelling device yeah and don't get me wrong i i enjoy my i enjoy my fair share of sims but um I've also had to endure think the monster games like the campaign for North Africa, which, if you haven't seen what if you haven't seen the board of that, um, you're you're not finishing that that game in one sitting. And I've seen that game start fights <laughs> <laughs> because it is the board the board for that game is lar- is larger than a small child. Jeez, like it's it's. I'd say, I'd, I'd say it I'd say it's about as I'd say it's almost as tall almost as tall as a, as an early middle schooler. Uh, <laughs> it it is the most infamous mo- monster game and the and the fact that it's going to take hundreds of hours to finish which is part of the reason why that thing starts fights. 
Oh. Well, then again, years later, we have Mario Party be um, starting fights and torturing people, so I guess some things never change. Right. You know, it's it's funny that you said that the the thing about story about storytellers and DMs being novelists. You know, the very first set of published tabletop game rules for a war game simulator, which is you know what Dungeons and Dragons began as, was actually written by Jules Verne. <laughs> yep. Um, Jules Verne dipped into it. I think H.G. Wells also dipped into it. Yep. So that so those that's definitely um there's definitely precedent. And by yep. the way, I'm sending you the infamous um size comparison image for the board for the campaign for <laughs> North Africa. Um this is this photo has gone in circulation for years with the caption of um the child is there for size comparison. Oh my goodness, that is giant. Yeah. How, I don't know. How did they afford to print that? <laughs> it's 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 not a board board. It's a glorified poster. Yeah, yeah. It's cr wow. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I can cons I'd consider get if I was ever get the thing again, I'd just hang the thing up as a poster. Because <laughs> <laughs> Lord, Lord knows, Lord knows, I'm not going to play it. And I shouldn't I shouldn't note as a minor note when it comes to the whole. Um, Bo um, game design, be game design, creating torturous moments, it not being new. I have <laughs> joked for the, I've had a running joke for the longest time that Jenga is a violation of the Geneva Accords regarding torturing non-combatants. Jeez. <laughs> if, if you've ever, if you've ever played Jenga, especially late game, then you know the pain. Especially, imagine, be, especially when you're in a room with five people and you're like. Nope, nobody breathed, nobody blinked, no sudden movements. <laughs> and and everybody glares at the one person who's about to sneeze. Which if that if that sounds if that sounds paranoid, well there are no there are no gamers in foxholes. <laughs> I know I know the line is supposed to be there are no atheists in foxholes, but I believe that it applies just as much. I mean, I'm pretty sure you. I'm pretty sure you've had your cases of um, dice superstition. You know, nobody touches anybody else's dice. Right. <laughs> uh, which I ended up get. I ended up getting. I ended up um, getting some custom dice made that had um, j that had Japanese numbers, so nobody could look at what nobody could look at mine. <laughs> I mean, they they could look, they just couldn't figure out what I what exactly I rolled. <laughs> uh, but given given what you said, it's it sounds like when it comes to difficulty, it's built on a rule of twelve. If you hit if you hit over twelve, you you pass. If you don't hit over twelve, you don't pass. Is That's that correct. correct? Uh, yep. You could and if you, call it a if you, you could call it kind of a dirty dozen rule. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, if you roll over, if you roll a twelve or higher, it's a success, and if you roll over a seventeen, it's a bullseye success, and that's how you get the, uh, you know, what we talked about earlier. That's how you get the, uh, the bullet point back. So there, there is, so there isn't a case of, um, get of getting automatics by rolling box cars or snake eyes. No, no. Now what we did do though is we we really like. Um, you know, you you have a pretty a pretty big uh, vocabulary of en encyclopedia in your brain of a lot of games. So um, I'm sure that you'll you'll know. You know, there's no there are no new game mechanics, right? Every, every game at this point is just picking the parts that they like and and repurposing them. And one of the things that we did is with this 2d6 system is we kind of kind of took this uh, advantages disadvantages system where you would roll the extra die and either keep the two highest for an advantage or keep the two lowest for a disadvantage um, and so we do that we call it an upper hand or a hurdle uh, but if you have an upper hand then you would actually roll three d6s and keep the two highest and that you know can give you a little help get into that 12 and and if you have a hurdle then you would keep the two lowest 
it helps us make the the dice rolling a little more dynamic yeah um i can just going through my assessments i just going through my assessments that i, that I had going over the um quick start i i could say that something i'd probably do to help to house rule it is that if if there is a one that's a um and but <laughs> Yep. Well, I don't think you don't need to house rule it. My game is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody everybody says that. Um, yeah, there's no such thing as a perfect game. I actually think it's kind of like I'm Pixar sh- says with their movies. They don't finish movies; they just release them. Oh, uh, the joke that I've always had is nobody plays Uno as written. Right. Exactly. And if if anyone claims that they do, they're lying. Everybody has their everybody has their own little house rule, their own variants, and the companies that that have made Uno over the years have encouraged it because I remember when I was a kid there was a special edition of Uno that w- that that was full of um, fan submitted house rules. Right. And well, Gygax house ruled his own game and admitted as such. There's a reason Rule <laughs> Zero exists. Yep. But now, when it com- now when it comes to the set, when it comes to the setting, because when you ha- when you have a game that's going to be very light on mechanics, that's uh, that's extra room that you can put into the world itself. Is it is it going to be a case where you have a broad area and so- and some bullet points so that individual GMs could fill in the blanks, or are you building it around a particular? Um, settlement on the planet so we've made the game so that you are playing in like uh, a continent sized area and everything within that area we're kind of gently talking about because it's divided into territories and we say things like you know this these are the products and the things that come from that territory and and a little bit about what the the ecology is like and the agriculture there and you know it, it's super dry or it's super wet uh, but we don't actually go into naming every single town that is on the map you know we hit the capital of that territory and usually uh, one other small town that has something of note to add some something unique to the area but for the most part you know we've we've even included in our rules, uh, in the core book, there is a section on building a town and how you can actually sit with your players during session zero or whatever, uh, whenever you want to do it. And uh, there's a set of questions you can ask them that will that will enable the whole group, including the tailspinner, to to build a town from scratch. So, uh, so it's not uh, it it kind of the answer is it kind of falls in the middle. We we built some walls around the sandbox, but we left plenty of room to for you to build your own castle wherever you like. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, have have has anybody has anybody during playtesting tried to do more of a hex crawl like approach when it comes to their campaign? Uh, you know, we don't, we haven't really had that, uh, and our, our distance system, the distance mechanics in this doesn't really support a hex crawl. Um, and because we didn't think that we really needed to do that because we're not going to be running dungeons, you know, or, or things like that. Um, our, well, so hex, hex crawl doesn't necessarily have to do a whole lot with dungeons. Okay, so the, let's um, let's let me make sure that that I'm understanding then what what you're referring to by that. Uh, hex crawls, which, which are is basically you have you have a map that's full of different hexes. You're having the player move along, the having the players move along those hexes, and re- and as they're moving, random events can um, happen. So you're so you're talking about like if if I could somebody run an Oregon Trail type game. If you want everybody to die of dysentery, then be my guest. <laughs> but I mean that kind of that kind of style that that uh, that feel. Mm-hmm. I mean I, there is no there is nothing in the rules that say you can't. Uh, you you know literally you would probably just need to decide as a tail spinner, you know how how many miles or feet 
you know, depending upon what sort of story you wanted to tell, but how many miles is each of those hexes? Um, and then just, just run it. Like, I don't, I don't know that you would necessarily actually have to, uh, build mechanic specific for that, uh, given the way, the way that our rules work. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I've not, I've not had anyone try to do that. I mean, I, I've had a lot of interesting things happen in play tests, but I've, I've not seen uh, a need for that. Uh, and I think some of that is because the genre, um, the genre of the Western, it is always very personal. You know, it's always about the gunslinger and the baggage he carries and the thing from his past that's affecting him and, and what's going on in the present. And on top of all of those things, the encroachment of progress you know one day my horse will be obsolete and everyone will be riding cars right there's always that threat of progress as as really almost the real villain in a western and so uh the the idea of needing to do uh, a system like that it was almost not personal enough for the western genre uh, but we do have a, a scenario that we run in our play tests where we do uh, a levitrain heist right and so um so we do have have one scenario that we've done where we do typically kind of lay out a uh, a map on the table and 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 track a little bit of movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can I can certainly get behind that. Oh, yeah, and of course of course of course even with this you couldn't you couldn't avoid referencing the great train robbery. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there are, you know there are. Um, there are not many stories in Westerns when you think about like, as far as like specifically, like you rob a bank, you stop a bad guy, or, you know, you are robbing a train. Like there's, there's some, some, some tropes that, that really dominate the wild West. I mean, you could run any story you wanted. I don't mean to sound like there's nothing to do in the game, but, uh, but the big tropes though are definitely tropes that we've all heard of and seen in, in Westerns. Yeah, and I know some. I know some people want to argue that we should we should avoid um, tropes, but I'd I'd say that in attempting to avoid tropes, you end up falling into you end up falling into new tropes. Yeah, and I also think that um, you play the games that you play mm -hmm. because you like the tropes, right? Like if if we were if you've chosen to play a western. Wouldn't you be mad if you didn't get to do a train robbery? <laughs> you know, like I'd be disappointed if I didn't get to do that trip. Like we, you know, if you were playing a Star Wars game, wouldn't you be upset that you didn't get to fight stormtroopers? Right. These there's, are the there's a running the gag in my that... in my campaigns that if I have if I ever have the players on some type of vehicle, uh, whether it be a train, whether it be an airship or or something, inevitably it will crash. <laughs> uh, much like how if if someone if, if someone is shot at at in a in a high elevation place, they will fall to their death. <laughs> uh, <you> know, <laughs> bullets may do you in, but gravity will not be denied its ritual sacrifice. Exactly. Uh, course in the in the same vein one of my players decided to make a perpetual motion engine by atta by attaching a um, peanut by attaching a peanut butter on toast to a cat yikes you know attach it to the back of a cat pick up the cat drop it and then hook that up to a generator because the cat always lands on its feet but the toast is always supposed to land peanut butter side down <laughs> You know, so it just it just keeps spinning. <laughs> but Jeez. the but even even with even with all of that, um, when it when it comes to the when it comes to the monsters, um, obviously ex expecting full on monster cu customization would be would be a bit much for a game of this scale. But do you have plans on on putting in a bit of an advice column to? Give give some hints and some pointers on customizing the monsters to fit a given campaign. Any, uh, we actually or just NPCs? we had rules for it. Oh no, we we put the rules for it in there. They're not in the quick start mm -hmm. that which is the, but they are in the the core rulebook. 
um, all of our, all of our, the, the great thing about, about the, the creatures in our game is they are all a combination of a dinosaur and, uh, and, and, a animal that exists, you know, kind of in our world. Um, uh, and so one of the things that, that, that made very simple then was, was for us to be able to give rules on how to create your own, um, how to create your own creature. And so, you know, there's, there's a little bit of mechanics to it and that like creatures come in three sizes, you know, there's a uh, small, medium, large, but, but we call them critters, varmints and beasts. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, each of those basically, each of those comes with a, a certain number of, uh, skill and attribute points. Um, and those animals don't actually have all of the skills. Instead, we just give them a single skill called wherewithal. And so uh, a beast would roll its attribute and its wherewithal. And the, the nice thing about the wherewithal as a skill is that if you aren't having to specify what skill it is, then just about anything you need the creature to do can be covered by just having that one skill. And so people can actually create whatever they want. Mm -hmm. But we do, we do have uh, some guidelines and, and suggestions on, on what to do. I mean, ultimately once the books at somebody's table, they can do whatever they want with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So uh, I, I believe the only way to win a role-playing game is to have fun. And if, if that means you hack my system uh, a little bit to to make your table have fun, then you know I'm I'm glad that I could help you guys enjoy yourself. Yep. And what, well, I did bring up rule zero earlier, so there's that. <laughs> yep. But with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count? Uh, we're looking we're looking to be uh, about two hundred and seventy is I think where we're going to land. And I am I will certainly be keeping an eye on on it, but thank you. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. I appreciate you having me. It's been a blast. And anytime you see fit to return, the door mm. is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you having me, and I hope folks will go uh, go to Kickstarter and look up the gum belt. And, and if you like what you see, I hope you'll consider backing us or finding us on Facebook or, or we're on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, as the gum belt. And uh, uh, outside of that, you know, I, I thank everybody for listening, and I appreciate you having me on. Yep. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>